Join us on a journey in Africa and we will teach you sustainable conservation and veterinary practices. Hello and welcome. Today I'm talking to Professor Wouter van Werven, a man who left deep footprints within the world of wildlife management. Welcome, Prof. Thank you, Dale. But firstly, some background on Prof. Wouter. He has a colorful career with many an ingenious solution to wildlife conservation issues. His highest qualification is a doctorate in science, specializing in ecology and physiology. Prof. van Werven's academic journey took him to the State University of Utrecht in the Netherlands, where he did a postdoctorate at the Department of Veterinary Biochemistry in Ruminant Digestive Physiology and Biochemistry, and some years later to Colorado State University in the USA, where he was a guest professor at the Department of Wildlife Biology. Thereafter, he held a guest professorship at the University of Vermont, also in the USA, for a period of seven years. In 1997, he founded Ecolife Expeditions, offering programs of excellent quality hosted in the African bush, carefully compiled to give valuable exposure to students and professionals in the veterinary and wildlife conservation fields. Today, I would like to share with you some of the outstanding work Wouter van Werven has done to make parts of Africa a better place for wildlife. On the topic of wildlife nutrition, his early research literally opened the microscopic world of intestinal protozoa and their role in digestion in wildlife in southern Africa. Prof, please tell us what your role was. Thank you, Dilop. It really started uh, by coincidence because I, I became interested in this topic and then went to Holland to go and do the veterinary biochem on uh, the cattle. They're famous for this cheese production, so they're good in cows and cow digestion. But after spending a year there and working on that, coming back to South Africa, what fascinated me was the variety of ruminants and just simply herbivores we have out here. From the smallest one, the dip dip, to the biggest elephants. And they all feed on plants. So how do they successfully, without competition, digest their food? And so I started looking into that. And once I started looking in the dip dip, for instance, and then the others, it became apparent that we're opening a real new world here. And, and you know, there was very little information available on the processes of digestion. And, you know, digestion is important because the efficiency thereof will also determine the capacity and the uh, extent to which they can digest their food. So we started working into that. Once you open up that can of worms, I found a variety of different kinds of protozoa together with the bacteria, which was totally new to science. We had the most unusual kinds of protozoans, for instance, some with legs, some with cilia that can swim, etc. So, you know, this, this, of course, we studied, we published it in the international science. And if I recall correctly, we, we found about 20 new species and an entire new family of protozoans in the gut of the rhino, for instance. So it was good stuff. And there's some pictures that you can see. The protozoa, for instance, which is responsible for 50% of the fermentation of the food, were most unique. Uh, in many species, it was to such an extent that you could take a sample of the rumen fluid of one animal, analyze it on a microscope, and identify which animal it was. So specific sure. they were. And then, of course, a host of new species were discovered, even up to a new family that we found in the, in the rhinoceros. And to study these things and the physiology, to bring that back to conservation was the interesting step because the efficiency of digestion would determine the carrying capacity in the field. 
and were all game ranches that started in the uh, late 1980s, it was an important aspect in wildlife management to know how many of which species you could keep on a set size of land without them competing. Wow, that's very impressive. So you're one of the people that gives these complicated names to these protozoa. <laughs> One of the unique wild animals in Africa is the giraffe. In the 1980s, you did research on these majestic animals, which provided information on blood pressure regulation to NASA. Why did NASA financially support a research project on giraffe in Africa? Uh, thanks, Dil. Yeah, I was just a member of a team. Uh, the other guys were more specialized in uh, blood physiology on larger mammals and there was one chap from uh, Sweden and the other guys were from America and they actually had this interest and had also the support from NASA but then approached me here in South Africa because they don't have that many giraffes in Sweden if we could maybe supply and participate so I agreed and we started doing that with giraffe that I had on an experimental a piece of land where I did experiments with giraffes feeding efficiency. So we used that very same animals and that worked well because they were quite tame. The interest was that the giraffe is the animal with the widest uh, variation in blood pressure of mm -hmm. any animal on this planet. It varies from zero millimeters mercury to over 500. Now that is unheard of in any other animal. And the interest that NASA had was that their astronauts out in space uh, do develop variations in blood pressure. And when they come back, some of them develop migraine. And that all had to do seemingly with the absence of gravity during the, the, the space uh, uh, exposure. So our study was more on the blood physiology and the, the circulation. And that led to some very interesting results. Also, why don't they get, for instance, varicose veins? Because they got an almost G-suit around their legs. And that also led to one of the uh, recommendations that the astronauts at certain times during the day should wear a G-suit to simulate artificial gravitation pressure on the body. Uh, I've noticed with giraffes that they have a very interesting posture when they drink water. Does that have any effect? Yeah, that's an interesting observation because, yes, it's not a matter that they cannot reach the water. They, if they stand just legs up straight, they would be able to reach. But that vertical column of blood from the heart to the brain in the arteri jugularis would become so high, that pressure, that on the brain it's going to lead that they can use, lose their consciousness. So the giraffe has adapted over the years to take a different posture when drinking water, straightening his legs out and his neck at about an angle of 45 degrees. And then is the vertical distance between the heart and the brain as a minimum. And he can successfully drink water without excessive blood pressure on the brain. Well, so they kind of regulate their own pressure in their heads that way. Now one can almost say it's one small step for the giraffe and one giant leap for NASA. <laughs> Just about. <laughs> Unexplained kudu deaths in the 1980s was yet another challenge that landed on your desk. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, that was, a, that was one of the very interesting studies. It is so that the wildlife ranching or private conservation in this country took off in the middle 1980s, early 80s. And there were many cattle sheep farms that were transformed into wildlife ranches, wildlife reserves, private wildlife reserves. And they stocked these with all sorts of a variety of wildlife animals and one of the popular ones was the kudu which is a beautiful majestic animal the males with its nice curly horns mm. everybody loved them 
Hunters like to hunt them, nice trophies, and so on. They've got good meat. So that was one of the popular ones. But after a few years, quite a number of these uh, ranch owners realized that kudus were also dying of seemingly in good condition, but they just died. And this escalated to such an extent there was a, a few hundred of these kudus that were dying only in one district, the Tabazimbi district alone. It was not a disease. It was not predation or any other cause. So eventually, you know, I started looking at this and came to the conclusion that this is a nutritional problem. And, well, it's a long story, but the end of the story is that these kudus are browsers. And browsers, that means they only eat leaves off trees. And the leaves in the trees, particularly the acacia trees, which is their favorite, have got tannins, condensed tannins in the leaves, which is a way of preventing overutilization. Just like you get thorns to prevent easy use, you get chemical defense mechanisms to prevent use. And we only then started realizing the dynamics of this. That if the kudus eat certain trees too heavily, that defense mechanism goes up. That tannin concentration would go from like 4% on a dry matter basis to more than 12%. Then it becomes a killer. So what we then advised at the end of this study is do not exceed the natural carrying capacity. Once again, go back and see how the good Lord made nature and try and copycat that. Don't try and do something totally different and expect it's going to work. Wow. It's almost like the plants started retaliating against the overuse by the kudus. Imagine if they didn't have that mechanism that wiped many plant species out. Yeah, actually. Then and they'd they, go extinct. Yeah, they'd go extinct. So the, the, the answer lies in, do the carrying capacity for kudus, like in open ranges, like in Kruger Park. In Kruger Park, there's, you, the average is four kudus on 100 hectares. If you maintain that in your garage, you're not going to have any mortalities. Makes sense. Just as nature intended it to be. Exactly. Now, one of the biggest projects, or the biggest project, that you have undertaken is the rehabilitation of the Kisama National Park in Northern Angola. In 1995, the year before I was born, you were approached by senior officials in the military when the Angolan Civil War was at its fiercest. The once flourishing Kisama National Park was in trouble. It was by then totally devoid of wildlife. And then you came into the picture. Yes, I, I was approached from the side of the top military brass in the Angola uh, army via diplomatic channels. If, if I could maybe assist, because quite a number of them grew up in that region where the Kisama National Park is, which is a beautiful park just south of their capital, Luanda, in northern Angola. And they went as kids to this park and there was all these animals. There was elephants and there was lions and giraffes and... You name it. Mm. And now all of a sudden there's nothing. This war continued for 27 years and it devastated the wildlife in that park. Because in a civil war, all the damage is inside your own country. Mm. And there was no infrastructure for people to get food, so they started poaching until there was nothing left. So these guys wanted to, to come back as it was. Uh, I went there. In the middle of the war, it was quite a hair-raising experience, I must say, the first time I went. Because you had to corkscrew the airplane down to pre prevent being shot with anti-aircraft guns. But I went to the park, looked at the park, flew around in military helicopters, saw, and in three days of flying, never saw an animal. Wow. So we decided then to create a foundation, that was my suggestion, because we couldn't use governmental funds for uh, a wildlife project. Because in a country in war, you need to use your resources for the people that were suffering. And that was more important. We started this foundation, the Kisama Foundation, 
got a nice board together and sourced funds from elsewhere, in particular from the oil companies, because Angola as a country is very rich in oil. And soon we had some funds, and with that funds and the support of the government of Angola, we studied the park, uh, created a special conservation area which was protected, and started with the reintroduction of the wildlife species that used to flourish in that park. And all this had to be done with airlifting. So we airlifted animals from Botswana and South Africa up into North Angola using uh, the IL-76 Russian cargo planes. So we took everything, elephants and giraffes and antelopes and zebras. And How was it to transport the, all of these different animals? Well, uh, we used uh, specially built converted containers for the bulk of the animals and we could put them in compartments within the containers, except, of course, the giraffe. And that was the one challenge. I mean, you couldn't put them in a container, they got these long necks. So we had to build uh, wooden crates, a little bit in the shape of a giraffe, uh, which was handy because now that uh, angled part of the crate, the wooden crate, also sort of followed the rounding of the aircraft on the sides. But that was, that was okay to put, uh, so we put two giraffes in one big crate and we took, the first lot was four of them, uh, two of these big crates. To get them in the airplane was okay because we had all the measurements, so it went fine. But now offloading in the bush in Angola with not good communication, that was a challenge. Because now uh, I, I had arranged for them to take a, 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 a fog lifter that can lift the crate put it on the, the low bed. They didn't bring that. So they brought a crane with, with a hoop, with the chains. So now they put four chains in each corner of this crate. So sure, what's going to happen? The whole thing is going to collapse. So sure, then the next thing is the whole top part of the box went flying. And so now we just had uh, the whole top end gone. But eventually with a lot, a lot of PT, we got these giraffes on that truck. And needless to say, one of the challenges was that the whole trailer at one point got loose and stuck in the ground. Big drama. Eventually we sorted that one out. But now you ride through this bush with this open top uh, crates with giraffes. And, well, they thought it was fun because every time there's a tree that comes by, ah, they you know, <laughs> taste the leaves in this new place. So that just went on. So, I think the giraffes didn't mind much this trip. Nice fresh air, have a bite of every tree that comes past, they don't even have to walk out. <laughs> but that was a challenge to move the giraffe, I can tell you that. So then when we had to offload, there's no rack. Because the, the, with the containers, you put the container on the ground. Now we couldn't. So hey, we got a bunch of shovels, everybody shoveled. We built a, 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 a ground, a dirt embankment before we could open up the crate, which we had to put together or hold together with the ropes. So we just opened the rope, the containers fell apart and the giraffe walked down the ramp. Yeah, I'm sure they were very happy to get into their new homes. Ah, they, oh, they flourished. They flourished. Now I can also think that those boxes gave a new meaning to the right side up sticker on the side of a box in travel. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the, side, the side up. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it, it started flourishing after that. It was really, it went very well. Tourism, became so popular because this was then the only place where you can really go and view wildlife in the whole of Angola at that point. Uh, we started in 1995. By, 19, uh, by 2002, everything was settled. And just soon after that, there was peace declared. And since then, the camps, they were just full of tourists. Yes, that's fantastic that you could help and rehabilitate that. It, it, was a, it, was a, it was a nice project, I must say that. So one of those situations again where like, people did something and then yeah. you, know, you come and help nature back on its track. Uh, you know, with a thing like that, it's never a one-man project. I mean, I had excellent cooperation from the Angolan military. They provided soldiers to help us put up the fences. Uh, so their support. And then I had as a team back here in South Africa also that supported to source the animals and veterinarians that uh, helped us to do a health check, make sure that we take good 
healthy animals out there. So it was a team effort, all the members of the Kisama Foundation. down the uh, uh, lying but they sometimes get also tired of standing so they lie down and this one is, is lying down but it's breathing fine so uh, we'll get her out it's, it's, I don't see this as being a problem we had the same situation uh, yesterday and uh, to separate them in order so that they don't move too much around in the aircraft and th those folds make it sometimes difficult for them to get up so we'll just remove the pole and then it can get out The airstrip where the aircraft landed is the Caballero airstrip, which is inside the Kisama National Park. And uh, from there to the actual release site where the elephants are then released out of the containers is a journey of about an hour to an hour and a half. The first part is easy going, that's the tar surface. Then we turn off along the river and then the going gets a bit more difficult. I just want two more waters. In the interest of the humane treatment of the animals, it is important to regularly stop and, and check that all the animals are okay. Particularly that they've got enough water for, for, elef for the elephants in particular. Um, they're very easy drinkers in transit. So we put water, we throw water over them, make sure that they're cool and that they've got enough to drink. We couldn't have passed for better weather. It's uh, overcast and cool, so it's uh, very good. Because they are in individual compartments within the containers and we release them one by one, it's just natural that they're going to go in any, in any direction. But uh, with communication, they form up and join together again within a few hours. Um, and in this case, they certainly did that. The next morning, they were all together. This is, uh, this is extremely exciting and also an emotional moment. It was an extremely difficult exercise. It's not easy to put uh, elephants into airplanes and fly them into Africa. The roads, the logistics, the trucks, it, it was not easy, but this was a, this was a textbook uh, delivery now. The, the elephants came out one by one, fine. You saw the one that was bathing itself with the dust. That shows it just checking the soil. And uh, no, we are extremely happy that everything went, went uh, there's always tense moments in this sort of operation. You know, you're always scared that something might happen to one of them. But uh, so this is the moment of great relief and happiness. Uh, we're extremely happy and, and, and also uh, for, the, you know, for the Humane Society that, that sponsored this uh, relocation. Also in their interest that all the animals are in good shape. 
There's not a single injury on any animal. They're all fine. So we're very happy. Thank you. There was enormous interest in this release of wildlife in the park. People came from Luanda, uh, many of them as you could see in this uh, film material. Many of these people have not seen elephants alive before. And with the release there were people with tears in their eyes. And they can remember the days that there was still animals some 20 years ago in this park. And this to them is a return to normality. And I think that this whole operation has made a tremendous emotional influence on people. Um, so you can see on the faces, they're happy. There's children that has never seen a live giraffe or a live elephant before. And I think this is going to an enormous impression on them. a few examples of the solutions Dr. Van Werfen provided to the management of wildlife in Sub-Saharan Africa during his career as academic at the Center for Wildlife Management at the University of Pretoria. The legendary Anne van Dijk, who brought back the cheetah from the brink of extinction by breeding them in captivity, contacted you when her captive bred wild dog pups didn't thrive. Yeah, that was an interesting problem. They, they, had, they had a problem of when these cubs reached the age of about uh, two and a half months, they just seemed to die. Uh, that's when, just when they started getting weaned. And, and there was various studies done by uh, other people on what could it possibly be. I also studied nutrition, as you've heard but not so much on uh, carnivores. But yet, it was an interesting challenge, and in the discussions with Anne van Dijk, my suggestion was that we should go again back to nature and see exactly how do these animals live in the wild. And what do they do in the wild is when the lead female starts uh, trotting and then running to go and catch prey with the rest of the group of wild dogs with her, they make a lot of noise, they yap, yap, yap as they run, eventually they catch an animal and they pull it apart, they must eat very quickly because they've been advertising that they're on the hunt, so they made it eat quickly if they want something of that, because lions and hyenas will pitch and jackal, vultures. So then after they've eaten, they then start trotting, walking back to the den. And that distance, sometimes five, six kilometers. And in that time, the meat, or pieces of meat in the stomach of the female gets already partly digested. By the time she gets to the den where the pups are, she then re this to the pups and they eat half digested meat. And they can carry on with that digestion and they flourish. But back in the enclosure with the breeding camp, they give the meat to the female, the female turn around, walk 10 paces to the den and re -utterate. No, there was no time gap for the meat to be pre-digested. That was the crux of the problem. So after that, the, the feed for females that have pups was altered to such an extent that they get like pre-digested food that is also suitable when it gets soon after intake by the mother given to the cubs. And that was the solve, that solved the problem. No, it makes complete sense. Yeah. It's fascinating how the behavior informs yeah, always, the digestion. I always tell my students, if you want to learn something about nature, go and look at nature. Don't always believe what you read in the book. <laughs> yeah. Moving on to reptiles, one of the largest and heaviest reptiles alive today is the Nile crocodile. These living links to prehistoric dinosaur-like reptiles are hardy, tough creatures. In our previous discussions, 
You mentioned that they also need a clean and healthy environment to thrive. Crocodiles were dying in the Olifants River system, west of Kruger National Park, and you were part of a team that solved this mystery. Yeah, that was an interesting study. You know, I'm not actually uh, much into reptiles, but okay. Um, crocodiles were dying indeed, uh, particularly inside Kruger National Park. And there was a team in Kruger Park that started monitoring this and, and to determine the extent of these mortalities. And then also, this, uh, once this inve in investigation uh, started, uh, a PhD student of mine, Alanis, uh, he started doing his PhD study on the crocodiles outside of Kruger Park and realized there were a lot of mortalities in that Olifants River system on that end as well. So, so I was therefore involved in this study. And the interesting thing is that in the high felt areas of South Africa, there was quite a bit of pollution in that river. And the pollution led to fish mortalities. <clears throat> and although we don't always see it, but crocodiles feed quite a bit on fish as well. With them feeding now on easy prey, which is dead fish floating on the surface, they've been getting Im imbalanced biochemicals in, like much higher levels of uh, amino acids uh, and certain vitamins that is associated with the decomposition of fish. But these chemicals then led to a situation which is like paralysis. They, they, they paralyze the tail and paralyze the base of the legs. And this is a disease which is known as pansteatitis. And uh, well, once this was then realized, of course, the source of the problem was water pollution. And that was addressed to a large extent and organic pollution of the river reduced substantially. And also there was much less and nowadays no more mortalities on uh, crocodiles. Wow, it's great you could figure that out. Yeah, I must give credit yeah. to the team and, and my PhD students. Yeah, once again, you know, you, you can't just pollute a source in nature and expect there's going to be no consequences. Mm. The, the sort of fun part, if you can call it that, was of course to go out at night to go catch these crocodiles and that's, that's in the river and in the big loss from that for taking blood samples. So we go out at night with the rubber duck, flashlights, and then if you see the eyes are wide apart, you know you've got a big crocodile. And then we had a system where you can get a noose around his head without him realizing it. And then once you pull that, you've got to, you put your crop. And then you must hang on to that boat because it's almost like becoming like skis. This thing is moving and you must hang tight on that boat. But eventually we can bring the boat to the water's edge and then drag the crocodile up onto you see, but then you can't dive the crocodile because he's going to pass out and drown. So you must pull him out by hand onto the shore and then you must jump on his back. And the first thing you do is you tie the sharp end the front with tape because they've got strong muscles to close but not strong muscles to open. So tape is good enough. And then you've got a, the crocodile under control and you can get the sudden blood samples. After that, on the count of three, everybody runs and the crowd goes back to the water. Yeah, it works. <laughs> <laughs> With such a vast amount of knowledge that you acquired in wildlife management in South Africa, did you work in any other African countries? Yeah, uh, interesting that you mentioned that. Uh, sure, well, we did quite a bit of work in other African countries. One of the first ones that we started was doing an, uh, a management plan for this was long ago, some 30, 35 years ago, in Botswana, doing a management plan for the Chobe and uh, Moremi National Parks. Uh, after that, I also did some work in the Congo, the DRC, and there was more the southern part, the Katanga province. And then an interesting project was in Sudan. And that uh, was a rehabilitation of the national park, the Dinder National Park, which is south of Khartoum on the border with Ethiopia. Fascinating park, and that's also the most northern park in Africa, 
where Europeans can come and see the big five. They're all there on that park, uh, but there's zero tourism and a lot of poaching. So we had to get some system going to be, have the local communities become independent from the resources of the park. We've but only touched on some of the cases that Pro Voter helped bring solutions to for wildlife challenges. To learn more about the work that he does, he is a very well published academic author, so you can find his work online. Pro Voter, thank you for your time. It was truly a privilege to talk to a living legend like yourself. I wouldn't like that label, but thank you. This man left deep footprints with astounding solutions and research outcomes during his academic career. Thankfully, his passion for teaching led to the founding of Ecolife, a learning environment where students and professionals can visit South Africa and embark on the field programs he has carefully compiled. This gives people the opportunity to gain valuable knowledge, born from Pro Voter van Wiffen's vast experience. You can find more information regarding Ecolife's programs that Pro van Wiffen created at www.ecolife.co.za. Thank you for watching and thank you for your time, Prof. You're welcome.